Okay, let's get started. Hello, my name is Alan Hudson from the Immuno Oncology Translational Network Data Management Resource Center. I also serve as Chair of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Before we start the seminar, just have a few bookkeeping items. Questions will be responded to at the end of the second presentation. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box, not the chat box. The audience can prioritize the order of questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Um, if you could indicate which speaker the question is directed to, that would be helpful as well. Closed captioning is available. The closed captioning for today's webinar can be accessed clicking on the live transcript option in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Instructions will also be provided in the chat box. With that, I'd like to turn the proceedings over to our moderator, Dr. Leah Mechanic. Uh, Dr. Mechanic is program director at the Genomic Epidemiology Branch of the Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program and NCI's Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences. Her responsibilities include managing a portfolio of grants related to genetic factors modulating susceptibility to cancer. Dr. Mechanic? Great, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our session today. In support to the next generation of cancer researchers, today's Cancer Moonshot Seminar will feature research from talented early career scientists. These are abstract-driven talks that were nominated by Cancer Moonshot investigators and selected by NCI staff. We're really excited to hear about their research. It's also my pleasure to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Kevin Johnson. Dr. Kevin Johnson is a research scientist in Professor Roel Verhoek's group at the Jackson Laboratory. He previously completed his PhD degree in molecular epidemiology from Dartmouth and a postdoctoral fellowship in computational biology at the Jackson Laboratory. Please take it away, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Dr. McKinnick. Um, for that kind introduction. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bethany Davis. Dr. Davis received her doctorate from the University of North Dakota, where she studied the role of exposure to environmental toxicants in kidney diseases such as diabetes and cancer. Currently, Dr. Davis is a postdoctoral fellow at the Translational Genomics Research Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, studying cancer drivers and mutational signatures in American Indian patients to improve cancer outcomes. Please take it away, Dr. Davis. Thank you for that kind of introduction. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk to you about a few of my projects that are looking to improve um, precision medicine for American Indians. Uh, specifically within the Southwest. Um, both of these projects that I will be going over are actually hit really close to home uh, because I am a member of the Terminal Band of Chippewa Indians. Uh, my tribe is located in North Dakota. Uh, one of the things that um, growing up, I should say, and then into my graduate careers, I would, uh, career, I would often hear about um, you know family members being um, diagnosed with cancer types, and it would also be associated with um, well, they were exposed to this um, type of environment, or they worked in this manufacturer company, so they had to have been exposed to something that caused their cancer because they had you know they lived a healthy lifestyle. Um, but we really don't know, um, and that and that is the issue, you know, when it comes to serving American Indians and trying to improve, you know, their cancer outcomes. And so, what, again, both of these projects really hit close to home because they are aiming to improve the precision medicine in American Indians. And so, American Indians um, are very uh, diverse in their ethnicity, their language, their culture. However, they're also um, they also have the unfortunate characteristic of um, uh, that they all share is that you know they have this profound cancer health disparity. Um, American Indians have one of the highest cancer rates of any race in the United States. It also um, comes with the worst survival rates, and diagnosis occurs at a much younger age. And so the bar graph on the left here you see are the cancer incident rates for American Indians in light blue and non-Hispanic whites in the black. And so you see um, the um, six different types of cancer that are common in American Indians. 
Um, but one that I have highlighted is the kidney cancer. And so the kidney cancer is roughly, you know, two to three fold higher for American Indians uh, versus non-Hispanic whites. And this is a problem because, you know, we really don't understand what is driving the kidney cancer um, or, you know, what are these individuals, um, these uh, nations, tribal communities being exposed to that is also contributing to their cancer onset. Now, when we look at the regional, um, the U.S. regional kidney cancer rates for American Indians, again, I have highlighted the two areas that I'm focused on today, um, Arizona and New Mexico. And so um, on the right, you see kidney and renal cancer cases uh, from 2013 to 2017. Again, um, American Indians in that teal color, uh, non-Hispanic whites in the maroon red. Again, you still see that um, the kidney cancer is roughly two to three times higher in American Indians versus non-Hispanic whites. You know, but why is that? We have all this advancement in technology, therapeutics, but yet we're still seeing these stark differences in kidney cancer for American Indians. And that is actually due to the fact that precision medicine is not precise for American Indians. I know this is a very bold statement, but one that is very accurate as well. Um, American Indians are um, heavily understudied in national genomic initiatives. So that is our first unmet clinical need. You know, how do we really, um, how are we going to help these um, individuals, you know, with their cancer outcomes if, you know, they're not participating or they're not involved in genomic research? And so this idea of precision medicine that, of, of improving precision medicine, we have to understand the genomic landscape of that cancer that is driving or that is affecting the community itself. Um, but again, if they're not, if they're not the focus in genomic research, we really can't help them. And so just to really drive home my points here, um, the image on the right you're seeing are um, clear cell renal cell carcinoma samples from uh, the TCGA. And what I have highlighted here are there different um, backgrounds that are that, that give rise or that contribute to the 385 cases that are found in the TCGA platform or database. And what you see at the bottom is that zero, zero percent are actually contributing, are, are contributed to the American Indians, specifically within the Southwest. And again, if we want to improve the precision medicine for these, these individuals, how are we going to do that when they're not involved in any type of genomic research? And so my, the overall mission of uh, the projects that I will be talking about is to improve precision medicine in Native American communities in the Southwest region of the United States. And one thing I want to note is that you're going to hear me um, interchangeably use Native Americans, American Indians, and Indigenous. Um, so just kind of bear with me as I, you know, go through the PowerPoint. Uh, the two of my projects that are going to um, that aim to improve the precision medicine. Um, the one on the left is the first one I'm going to talk about. This is a um, NIH or NCI Cancer Moonshot funded grant. Um, it is titled Engagement of American Indians of the Southwest Tribal Nations in Cancer Genome Sequencing. And then the second project I'm going to talk about is one that is uh, non-NIH funded, um, and it's looking at mapping the molecular bases of cancers in American Indians of the Southwest, specifically working with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community in Arizona. <clears throat> so, here is um, essentially all the main players, individuals um, that are involved with this uh, larger project, um, Moonshot Project. Um, there are essentially three different branches of this project. So the top row here um, are the individuals that are involved with the Participant Engagement Unit. Um, they're going to be involved with you know, recruiting the patients. Um, and then the second row, you have the Engagement Optimization Unit, or the EOU. Uh, these individuals are going to be involved with, um, you know, the surveys, uh, making sure that anything, any questions that we ask, consent, everything is going to be culturally appropriate. And then you have the genome characterization a unit where I'm involved, or the GCU. And this is going to be involved with the ge uh, genomic profiling of the tumors and um, providing it back to the individual patient sample for therapeutic um, intervention. Um, this project is um, overran or over, um, oversight uh, from Dr. Cheryl Lohman and Dr. Jeffrey Trent. 
And so a couple of weeks ago, um, there was a talk, you know, um, just kind of hitting home in terms of, uh, as you would say, guidelines or um, guidelines for working with Indigenous communities. And one thing that I want to point out before I jump into the GCU part of this project is that we really hit all these points uh, really closely and um, accurately as possible. Uh, one of the main things that I want to point out is that this project will have immediate clinical utility uh, to participants and uh, results will be shared with the, both the participants and the health provider. So again, they're going to have immediate results uh, once there is genomic profiling of their tumors that can um, immediately improve or identify therapeutic targets, um, also uh, therapeutic regimens that can help with that cancer outcome. So again, um, there's seven little guidelines here um, that individuals or researchers, medical professionals should follow when working with Indigenous communities just to make sure that um, they are being most respectful um, on the science side, but also making sure that you're uh, respecting the, the culture of the, the individuals that are involved in the research. <clears throat> so uh, a quick update um, highlighting the first month of this project in January of this year. Uh, we roughly have 11 um, patients that were enrolled in January. Again, you have the tumor types here on the right, anywhere from breast to colorectal um, to GI, um, right now, we are up to 18 patients um, that are fully enrolled, and we are hoping to enroll, you know, up to 1,000 um, in the upcoming years. And so the GCU is going to be um, actually one of the um, largest genomic profiling that is going to generate um, generate data across American Indians um, uh, of participants. And so one thing, again, we want to know that the one thing I want to highlight, excuse me, is that it's going to be a CAPCLIA base. So again, we're going to be able to return the results immediately so that way the patient and the doctor can identify that therapeutic target to uh, for improvement of their cancer outcome. Now, the one thing about um, my project is that I'll have all this data um, I'll be able to dive further into um, the genomic profiling and investigate, you know, the mutations, the disruptive pathways that are contributing to the cancer onset as well. And so that actually leads into uh, my supplement project. Um, and so both of these projects um, really lay that foundation for my supplements and what I will be talking in a little bit. Uh, the second project that I'm going to be introducing here is the one that's going to be involved with the Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. Um, and you're going to watch a little clip um, just kind of firsthand from the Honorable Martin Harbier. Um, he is the president of Salt River, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And you're just going to see firsthand, um, you know, their, their interview in terms of, you know, what they experience with the kidney cancer. The numerous health concerns that we have, our community's uh, average age of death for our females is at 52 years and our male at 49. We miss out on almost 30 years of life compared to others. The true success of a community is the health of its people. In our way of life, it was always about thinking about the future generations. How our ancestors had a way of healing people. We have a uh, a strong belief about the sanctity of the human body. The concept and the principles of those things continued to guide us. One of the friendships that we created was the late Senator John McCain. I received a call from him and he was really excited about this opportunity to bring what now is called TGEN to the valley. Being born in Arizona, I have long recognized the great but unmet medical need that tribal communities have. It was really the meeting with the SRP that cemented the importance of trying to ensure that tribal communities had same access 
to medical breakthroughs from the Human Genome Project. I went back to the Salt River Council. In one night, they saw the opportunity. They agreed to contribute $6 million to this effort. Native people, particularly Pima people, we have the highest numbers of diabetes in the world. Children as young as five years old were being diagnosed with diabetes. Kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma, was also determined to be fairly high among us as opposed to the general population. A lot of our members that are, are diagnosed with kidney cancer, and unfortunately, it's kind of at the final stages. Through some of the research and through some of the testing that has gone on here, they really feel that they're very close to finding these identifiers that can detect early signs of kidney cancer. The role that Dr. Trent played in keeping us informed has been very good. I've had the privilege on a regular basis meet and explain opportunities that we could work on at the request of the community, starting with diabetes, moving to renal cell cancer. Dr. Trent comes out and explains to us what the, the next steps are. Lots of respects exchanged both ways. Keeping that communication line open is important where we're at today as far as a relationship. 20 years ago, that initial meeting has sustained a partnership for five administrations committed to building trust and following the tribal lead. The work we're doing with the Salt River community has tremendously increased understanding of the genetic changes in tribal communities. What we're doing here with Tejan will enable other tribes to look at genetic research, and there may be ways that it can apply to them because we're all related. For centuries, tribes in the U.S. never had adequate health care. This is something that can be good, not only for us and our future generations, but across the nation and around the world. Thankful for the work that they do and things that we can do now help the quality of life for our members going forward. So um, as, the, as the video just mentioned, you know, they, they completely understand um, the complications associated with the high, um, high number of cases um, when it comes to the kidney cancer. Um, but again, the, these projects that I'm presenting today are going to be very beneficial, you know, in helping these individuals, helping these communities um, live a long, longer life, um, and that, that it would be the ultimate goal. And so my hypothesis for my overall projects is that I will identify functionally uh, relevant and unique mutational signatures and molecular pathways that are going to be disrupted um, in American Indian cancer samples, along with their identification, um, will help us provide insight into the cancer uh, pathogenesis progression, um, but also improve the diagnoses and treatment. And so my project goals are to improve, again, that precision medicine in American Indian communities in the Southwest region of the United States uh, by first mapping the molecular pathways of cancer, starting with clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Um, another project goal would be to provide results and awareness back to the communities or the patient. Um, and then the research progression is gonna be based on the needs of the community. Um, there's gonna be effective communication with the tribal leaders and various services, and then also establishing lifelong partnerships and friendships with these tribal communities. <clears throat> so um, looking at the participations um, that are involved in these projects, um, the, the top one is gonna be New Mexico or on the left and Arizona is gonna be on the right. Um, we're just gonna um, kind of lay out all the um, tribal nations that are involved in these um, these projects. Um, the one, this, um, the one again that was in the video is the Salt River, um, Pima Maricopa Indian community that's in Arizona. And so one thing about cancer, it's not a one size fits all type of thing. You know, uh, we might identify what is causing cancer in one individual, but it might be completely different in another individual. 
Uh, one other thing we also have to look at is the environmental uh, relationship or uh, contribution to the onset of the cancer. And it's very important because 50% or well over 50% of tribal nations are going to be located near abandoned mines. Now, these abandoned mines are contaminated with some form of heavy metal toxicants such as arsenic or lead or cadmium. Um, and these are known to be drivers of cancer. Specifically, um, cadmium and lead are known drivers for kidney cancer. And so if I can identify the mutational signature that is associated with the cancer, I can then match it to the carcinogen that these uh, tribal nations are exposed to. Um, and then that can help us identify, you know, therapeutic targets, improving pr uh, personalized medicine, but also providing awareness back to the community. Like, this is what you're being exposed to. Um, how, how can we, as a group, you know, limit or decrease the exposure to prevent onset of cancer? <clears throat> and so the um, genetic la or the genomic landscape of kidney cancer, we know that there are a lot of a uh, wide variety of different pathways, disruptive pathways that contribute to clear cell renal cell carcinoma. But again, we don't really know which of these pathways are going to be involved in the cancer onset for American Indians. So again, identifying both the mutational signature and the disruptive pathway will give us more of a clear picture um, that is causing the cancer in American Indians. And so um, for my aims of the project, I will be looking at um, clear cell renal cell carcinoma. So I have 50 samples from uh, American Indian patients of New Mexico. I will also have 50 samples from Hispanics and non-Hispanic whites. So it's basically a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. And so my first aim would be looking at the mutational signature. Um, specifically, I want to identify, you know, what is the environmental aspect that is contributing to the cancer onset. And then in aim two, I'll be looking at the molecular pathway analysis, really trying to identify the disruptive pathways that are also contributing to the cancer onset. And so my future directions uh, for the, uh, these projects are to expand these techniques to other prevalent forms of cancers in American Indians. Um, that show disparities or poor outcomes. So if you remember back to the middle part of my presentation and um, with the GCU outcome or the GCU uh, landscape, I will have the genomic profiling data for you know different types of kidney or different types of cancer in American Indians. So I will already have that data and I can dive just a little bit further and look at the mutational signature, look at the dysregulated pathways, really hone in into again what is causing the cancer onset or the cancers in American Indians. And then this will lead to um, identifying biomarkers or pharmaceutical targets that can help, again, uh, not only with cancer screening, um, but also, again, improving the precision medicine in American Indians, which is the ultimate goal for these projects. So with that, I would like to first acknowledge um, all the individuals, tribal leaders, advisors um, from New Mexico and Arizona um, that you know, really made this project possible. And then finally, I would like to acknowledge um, my advisors um, that are, um, you know, helped me throughout this project. Um, my direct advisor, Dr. Trent, um, my, another advisor of mine, Dr. Cheryl Willman, and then the four individuals on the bottom of the screen, they're actually serving on my postdoctoral committee. So I will meet with them to, to discuss research, um, just kind of bounce ideas off and make sure I'm on the correct um, path for success in my career. Um, and so they are Stacey, Dr. Stacy Gray with City of Hope, Dr. Tim Whitset, uh, Dr. Jeffrey McKeegan and Dr. David Duggan, all with PGEN. And then finally, I would like to acknowledge our funding sources from the NCI Cancer Moonshot Grant. Thank you, Dr. Davis, for an engaging outline of your, your two projects. Uh, our next speaker is Rebecca Smith. Rebecca Smith is a health service research doctoral student at Dartmouth College and a member of the Dartmouth Institute's Comparative Effectiveness Research Program led by Anna Tostason. She studies how innovations in cancer care impact health access, outcomes, cost, and quality of care. She is currently focused on examining how innovations in digital care impact access with the overarching goal of informing equitable access to cancer care 
across the urban rural continuum. I'll let Rebecca Smith take it away. Uh, great. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, and uh, thank you to everyone at NCI and everyone here today for the opportunity to share what I've been learning with you all. Um, so as, I just wanted to make sure you're seeing the right screen, you are. As a PhD student, part of my thesis work is focused on evaluations of the impact of digital care in cancer care and projections of that potential impact. So I found that on uh, multiple projects I've joined um, that there's a need to incorporate measures of broadband into measures of access and also a need for a more in-depth understanding of the available measures to do that. So today I am going to present on what I've learned about the digital divide in the context of uh, healthcare and cancer care. And I'll focus most of this presentation uh, sharing what I've learned about what available measures there are for broadband to incorporate into our work. And I'll wrap up with some missing pieces and what the next steps are. Uh, and so according to Webster's Dictionary, it's already in Webster's Dictionary, the digital divide is the economic, educational, and social inequalities between those who have computers uh, and online access and those who don't. So the digital divide is a measure of disparity and in the context of healthcare, a disparity in access to care. And uh, so here online means access to broadband, which then supports access to telehealth. Um, and there are many terms used interchangeably in practice, uh, such as telehealth and telemedicine, uh, but most widely, the most widely accepted use of the term telehealth encompasses um, general digital, digital technologies um, that support care over distance. And that's how I'll be using that term today. Uh, and so that includes a gamut of care, such as remote patient monitoring, uh, M Health, which is mobile health technology, video conferencing, um, phone meetings between patient and provider, provider and provider. And um, so with the pandemic, as we all know, we've seen uh, the use of telehealth skyrocket. We've seen rapid updates in infrastructure now in place for telehealth. Uh, there's payment parity, I think through 2023 or part of, uh, part of this year. As of now, there's extended waivers for telehealth use. Um, but importantly, there's been sort of this ripping off the Band-Aid, so to speak, um, of using telehealth for patients and clinicians for the first time. And often that first step is uh, the hardest one to take. And so this is all to say that uh, digital care is here to stay. It's shown um, some feasibility in cancer care use um, and patient and clinician satisfaction. So we also know... Uh, access is a key driver in cancer care disparities, particularly in rural cancer care. And some of the many factors uh, for this include long distance to cancer care facilities, limited access to healthcare providers in rural areas, um, transportation limitations, uh, and a lack of data regarding um, the extent of access problems. So, there we go. So, um, well, it's common to measure and account for in-person access, measuring digital care access uh, is a newer consideration and hasn't um, really been incorporated much in the literature yet, um, but it really is a critical component of access, especially given that there are many Americans who uh, are considered under terms, uh, underserved, excuse me, in terms of broadband access needed to support digital care. So here's an example of a national um, map of broadband need. Uh, this is put out by uh, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA. Uh, they are an executive branch agency that's responsible for advising the president on national telecommunications matters. Um, and the agency has a current initiative to support expanding broadband access and use in the US. So on this map, um, 
need, uh, broadband need has areas in red showing broadband speeds lower than 25 megabits per second download and lower than uh, three megabits per second upload. And so that uh, speed is suggested as the standard for efficient internet use uh, by the FCC and others. Um, there probably is some wiggle room, um, both up and down depending on how many devices are being used in a household and for what. Um, but what this map is suggesting is the areas in red might be experiencing, people in these areas in red might be experiencing things like uh, freeze frames on video connections, like we've all probably experienced with Zoom, like I was hoping to not experience today, so far so good. Um, they might be experiencing cutting in and out when talking on a video call which can have a negative impact on a, a patient visit, particularly in cancer care when there's um, already a lot of patient stress and burden. And so uh, what strikes me right away when looking at this is the vast need in the US for broadband. And also we can see that there are areas where there's more need um, than others. So this brings us to um, what existing data sources do we have to account for this variation in, in access? Uh, and so when the pandemic hit uh, and the limited understanding of where broadband need was unmet in the country came to the forefront, the digital divide became a focus of policymakers. And I hope you're not seeing these messages in front of, oops. No, we're good, we're good. Okay, good, I'll go back, thank you. Um, and so, uh, so there's been some federal funding allocated to increase broadband access, uh, but it was difficult to accurately know where the need was. So NTIA, and you just saw one of their um, national maps, worked to create some updated broadband mapping available to the public. Uh, the data are available at the county level, the census block, and the census track level. Um, it combines data from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, through the American Community Survey, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a minute. Uh, the Federal Communication Commission, FCC maps, MLAB, UCLA, and Microsoft, which are um, private organizations. And um, so just to note, the Federal Communications Commission is a different agency than NTIA. It over, it's overseen by Congress and manages um, international and interstate communications in all 50 state, states. So that includes broadband, um, residential broadband, and uh, broadband at hospitals. Um, and so what's the accessibility of the NTI data for research? Um, the map data are available for download of some of the broader aggregated measures. And that's what I just showed you a second ago. There we are. Um, so this is an example of a few of the fields that you would get if you were to download the NTI data. Um, actually, they don't offer that much. So there's not that much more than this, but these are some of the main ones. Um, there is some more. So what's nice about these, these data and these maps is um, they combine multiple sources into one place to get a look at both availability of broadband and actual use of broadband. As you'll see, as I go through some of the other measures, sometimes they only um, say one, availability or use. Uh, so availability is reported by internet service providers uh, and it's the level of service that could be purchased by a consumer so it's often reported as higher than what's actually used, whereas actually use is what the consumer is truly using or not. Um, and so these NTIA maps uh, also give available broadband speeds and actual speeds through speed test data from both MLAB and UCLA. And uh, MLAB and UCLA are both organizations that provide services for fixed broadband and mobile network speed test uh, data and analysis. So that sort of uh, information may be important to consider when designing or measuring access or use of digital, digital care modalities. It's also important to be aware um, of the limitations. I'll mention those. Um, the this, this speed tests are consumer initiated, so they may be limited to a, a younger demographic um, who have interest in testing their speeds like gamers uh, or who are likely higher to pay for uh, likely more likely to pay for higher speeds, um, or it could be businesses where it's somebody's role to test and improve internet technology related aspects of the business. Um, 
And so uh, there are known deficiencies in the FCC broadband mapping of speeds, which has been a problem in policy focus due to reliance on these maps for efforts to increase uh, broadband in underdeveloped areas. Um, that's part of why NTI developed their broadband maps, but the FCC is the, the group that's been charged with updating mapping to really deal with the issue of unserved areas. So you can see, um, and this is a, an older map um, that's sort of highlighting the past problem, um, where the FCC reported only 24.7 million Americans without broadband, where uh, Microsoft, using their consumer download data, estimated 162.8 million Americans were without broadband. So there's this vast gap here between these estimates that needed to be addressed. Um, and how the information previously was collected for the map, the FCC map on the left, um, was through their form 477, but that's being phased out now. Um, so internet service providers twice a year did and will still submit information to the FCC on service speeds available, but uh, rather than by census block as it had previously been reported, it's now down to a, a serviceable uh, location level. So that's like an individual house or business. Um, and the service speeds used to be determined in this map on the left by listing all households in an area as having access to broadband if at least one household in that blocked area had access. Uh, so this is known to overestimate access. And um, here you can see a comparison of differences between mapping efforts. So the old FCC mapping on the left seems, uh, and this is an example with the state of Georgia, seems to show less need in Georgia than on the far right where level of need is uh, denoted with color blocks. So more need is indicated here by uh, darker color. And uh, the map in the middle is um, the NTIA mapping that still incorporates it, the old FCC mapping or did um, in 2022, late 2022 when these maps were made. So you can see there is some improvement with the NTIA maps, um, but the state mapping on the right shows much greater need than what had previously been captured. Um, and that's what the FCC maps are hopefully shaping up to look more like. Uh, it's worth noting um, when using the FCC data, it's important to consider that the mapping is a broadband availability, but not actual use, which I had mentioned some of the differences before. So they don't get into use or pricing or anything beyond availability. Um, so, so now with the updated maps, there's the ability for states, organizations, individuals to challenge the accuracy of the maps. So in this example uh, with Georgia, if the new maps don't reflect Georgia's state mapping here on the right, they should submit a challenge to the FCC. Um, and so there's a time window for that process. Although you can submit a challenge at any point, the time window is related to allocation of federal funds and states uh, to states based off need displayed from the map. So, um, uh, so you can submit at any point, but it's actually open right now um, for the second round of maps. So we may see some change in the, that mapping. Um, this challenge process highlights the remaining limitations about accuracy of map locations, um, which are whether all locations exist on the map, and then if they reflect access at the location accurately. Uh, and there are strict rules about how maps can be challenged, which also cause concern about getting the most accurate maps possible. For example, uh, speed tests that allow a different level of available broadband speed than um, what is in the FCC data for mapping are not considered sufficient grounds for a challenge. Uh, and so about the data, the data are publicly available. Um, and like I mentioned, they're in the second round of an open challenge window currently. And um, so how the maps can be used for health service research, the old FCC maps were at the census block location and could be readily mapped to other measures using census block, um, such as RUCA codes or other measures of rurality. Uh, or the area deprivation index at the nine level zip code. However, the new FCC maps, even though they are essentially at the, the nine level zip code are mapped with um, unique identifiers uh, specific 
to those maps. Um, and that's because a combination of data sources were used to create the map. So from what I've seen, this creates um, extra steps of needing to use text to map the location back to zip or, or whatever you eventually want to map it to. Um, so I want to go on to the next data source, which is also uh, used in the NTIA mapping, which is the American Community Survey, or the ACS. Uh, it measures actual use of broadband in their sample as part of the census survey, um, except ACS surveys are conducted yearly, not, not just every year. Um, so it measures availability by, uh, sorry, excuse me, not just every 10 years. Um, so it measures availability by directly asking households if they have access to the internet. Um, and the questions that pertain to broadband on the survey, you can see here, essentially they're, um, do you own equipment to access the internet? Do you have internet access? And um, which of those devices do you access the internet with? Uh, so the ACS is measured at the census block group level, which is nice when using claims or um, larger population studies, and you're not worried about the accuracy of the measure for a, a specific subset. Uh, it is publicly available, or um, the sets, and uh, there are some limitations in terms of timing. So although the ACS does offer one-year estimates, the sample is quite small for the interest of broadband access, particularly in more rural areas, which are most concerned with the question of broadband. Uh, so the five-year estimates are better. We have to keep in mind that these estimates are collected over the entire uh, five years, then made available a year later. So a lot can change in this time frame for broadband uh, and technology access relative to some of the other measures um, on the survey, such as uh, housing demographics that are comparatively more stable over time. And um, so for most purposes, what I've mentioned already, the, the FCC, uh, the American Communi Community Survey, or the um, combined NTIA data will be the most applicable and useful, but um, there may be some instances when more detailed information about broadband access is necessary. One of many examples would be for capacity planning when you may need to be able to measure the reliability or durability of broadband speeds over a certain um, time period. Just like for in-person planning, it may be necessary to understand bandwidth at specific times to support a quality video connection. Um, so MLAB and UCLA offer speed test data that allows for view of different time points throughout different time periods. UCLA offers uh, specific hospital broadband data and um, some other categories, but uh, is limited in what they'll offer without payment. And um, also some states have been working uh, even before the plans for the new FCC maps to create their own broadband mapping in order to better understand where coverage is lacking uh, and request and allocate resources appropriately for, for those areas. Um, Virginia and New York are good examples with state-run programs to look at. Uh, some data are available through their online mapping tools, although not as much or as easily ex accessible as uh, the federal level um, sources that I, that I just went over. Um, Importantly, these states are in a position to know where the new FCC maps are still inadequate and submit challenges. So this is both good and bad from a data perspective in that um, it'll likely delay the process for um, release of, uh, of updated data from the FCC due to large scale challenges, but will ultimately result in more accurate data. Um, so an example of that is New York submitted a challenge in October for more than 31,000 locations missing uh, from the mapping. So that may take some time for the FCC to resolve. And um, so understanding the digital divide and considering broadband as a component of access is a critical consideration for measuring disparities in access to care. Uh, the rapid increase in digital care availability due to the pandemic makes it easier for many patients to receive care while minimizing some of the harms like uh, traveling and reducing the cost and time away from work, the cost of traveling and the cost of time away from work. Um, but there may be some people who are left behind um, and at some point no longer receiving the highest quality of care they could as, as uh, our models develop. Um, and I've been fortunate to engage in projects including 
um, under this this cancer moonshot that are working to measure and develop the potential that digital cancer care offers and simultaneously trying to account for and avoid creating further disparities in care. Uh, to do that, we're finding ways to account for digital care access as a key component of access. And um, there are data sets out there to do this, as I've reviewed today, that we can incorporate into our work. And so some next steps um, for my thesis work include quantifying the potential for improved cancer care outcomes if digital care is expanded based on a variety of factors, including um, expanded broadband access. Uh, so this will be with Medicare claims based work um, using an expected value framework to look at expansion of telemedicine, which is the um, patient to provider visit portion of telehealth. Um, and looking at expansion of an electronic patient reported outcome platform. Ideally, that expansion is at the national population level. And so I'm, I'm very excited to be um, here talking about this with you folks and, and here at Dartmouth engaging in this work. Um, and so with that, I will say thank you for having me today to share some of what I've been learning in, in my um, doctoral studies. And I want to thank my mentors and others who've engaged me in the related projects listed here. And I will hand it back for the Q&A. Oops, stop share. Thank you, Rebecca. So I think the way we'll do this is go through um, some of these questions that we have in the Q&A. A reminder, if you have, still have a burning question, you can deposit in there and hopefully we'll get to it. And we'll, we'll alternate uh, here. So the first question is for Bethany Davis. It's, are the environmental mutational signatures for carcinogens already established in the genomics literature? Or is this an output of your analysis? And have these uh, signatures been validated for uh, renal, renal cell carcinomas? Right, so the um, examples that I provided in my presentation, um, those are already established um, mutational signatures um, readily available in literature. A lot of the ones that um, are not, we'll, we'll have to uh, make adjust, adjustments to identify if there's um, any other heavy metal or environmental aspect that's contributing that's not seen in literature. Um, as for the, what was the second part of the question? The second part, it was whether it was uh, sort of validated. Um, as far as clear cell renal cell carcinoma, it is not validated. Um, the mutational signature is not validated um, in uh, the American Indian sample sets. However, there are uh, mutational signatures associated with clear cell renal cell carcinoma in non-Hispanic whites. Um, so we, we do have some signatures to go off of, um, but again, they're not validated in American Indians. And I guess a follow-up question for me on that is, do you have measures? I mean, you had the location of the mines for uh, environmental exposures, but any of the other molecular markers you have to give you indication of heavy metal exposure? Um, so the... Um, there, there are some um, markers that I were I was interested in um, specifically for my graduate work that kind of um, transcended into my post grad work um, that I would be looking at, but um, I, I'm not at liberty to tell you what they are. <laughs> um, but there are some that I'm specifically looking at. Yep. Great. So I think we'll move to a question for Rebecca. This is regarding the digital divide. Does that term include or address when content isn't accessible to persons with disabilities, such as videos without captioning for deaf persons, audio descriptions for blind persons, visual web content not accessible to blind persons, telehealth that doesn't allow capturing, and American sign language interpreters, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think the definition of the digital divide encapsulates all of it, um, but it is worth noting that um, what's in the literature, there's not a lot addressing um, folks with um, any sort of disability, hearing impairment, or um, uh, trouble with translation, with language. Um, so there is really a lot of work that needs to be done. This is all 
not brand new, but this rapid expansion of telehealth is new to all of us. Um, and there's a lot of ground to be covered to make sure we're inclusive about it. Cool, thank you. I guess for Dr. Davis, it's a somewhat of a follow-up question to the first one in the sense that, are you thinking about other molecular markers for signatures beyond mutations? Um, and I think the molecular markers here are associations with the, the tumors, maybe copy number or, or microbiome. Yeah, so we are definitely looking at um, mutations um, associated with other cancer types, um, like, like you said, within the microbiome that is in um, some of the later stages of the project. Um, the, those specific pathways, um, I guess would have to, uh, what I'm thinking of, because my focus is primarily kidney cancer, um, but I want to know if there is, uh, if there is, you know, something that, you know, that's associated with digestion, anything that could contribute that way, like we eat, whatever we eat, diet, and how that contributes to kidney cancer. So there are those aspects that we will be looking at, um, specifically markers um, that are already available. But again, we would have to make sure we are seeing it in our cohort. Is your uh, cohort open to any tumor type or is it restricted to a select? Because I noticed you had like colorectal, um, gastrointestinal, and maybe a few others. They seem to be repetitive. Are they open to any cancer or just a certain number? Correct. They're, they are open to any cancer type. Um, those are just the ones that we have um, recruited so far. Cool. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Rebecca. What are your thoughts about how researchers communicate findings, given this large discrepancy or, or stark difference in broadband access? Um, well, I think it depends on what the research is and what we're communicating. Um, and, and part of why I've done this sort of background um, information sharing today is um, because I'm working with Medicare claims and so I'm doing population level um, sort of work. And so I think that's really important to um, to include measures of broadband and who has access and who doesn't. Um, I know that there has been a lot of work um, it, throughout the country, other teams um, since the pandemic for creating new models with telehealth. And that's like much harder to uh, describe populations that don't have access, but it is important, an important note, um, you know, that we shouldn't forget that as we're, we're sort of barreling forward with all of this digital health, that there's uh, a whole population that we're just not thinking about. And, you know, we've seen that in many other um, areas of healthcare. So it's just a reminder that um, we need to always keep that in mind. For someone who's less familiar with telehealth, does this include both uh, by phone call only, or is it specifically for um, sort of Zoom type communications? Yeah, well, that's one of the big questions now, actually, um, and trying to figure out with payment parity. Um, so phone is considered part of telehealth because it's over distance. Um, and then there's some debate about um, how effective it is. It's it's more effective for, for different sorts of visits um, and also who it serves best. So if you don't have broadband access or if you're maybe older and more comfortable with just the phone. So there's, there's actually a lot of work that needs to be done in that area, but phone is um, considered part of telehealth. So for Dr. Davis, I'm going to sort of combine these two questions because I think they touch on the same thing is uh, the first one is why in the East are the stark differences in kidney cancer not as dramatic as in the Southwest? And more globally, are there any clues from your analyses or your research about why American Indians cancer fatality is worse globally? So I think these are all both tied to outcomes in general. No, those, the, those are great questions. Um, so when you look at the regional differences um, in the Southwest, the Midwest versus the East Coast, one of the biggest differences was the, um, I guess, the, the glacier aspect of it. And so this is, this actually is one thing that um, kind of attracted me to Arizona was um, there is a higher, higher amount of uh, lead and arsenic in the environment in um, the Southwest. So again, those are both heavy metal toxicants. They're gonna to heavily target the kidney. Um, therefore, they could lead to cancer onset. 
uh, versus the the east you know you don't have those sediments or those heavy metal toxicants being um i guess uh, deposited in the environment by those glaciers now that that could be different in terms of uh, fertilizer aspect again when you look at um the southwest versus east there's um southwest there, there's a lot more farming um so there could also be pesticides playing a role into that heavy metal depositing into the environment um versus the east so that would be one of my um, biggest things to look at would be just the environmental differences between the two regions and what exactly is the cause of it. And then as for um, the second question, can you repeat it again, please? Yeah, it was it was related to the global differences in American Indian fatalities due to cancer compared to other groups. Um, I, I, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of a lot of contributing factors. One, um, you know, the you have to think about other um, health complications that might be contributing to the cancer, um, like for for example, um, undiagnosed diabetes. You know, diabetes is one of the biggest targets for um, kidney, and if it's not being treated, um, it, it definitely will again affect the kidneys, which can eventually lead to kidney cancer. So I think one of the, you know, the first things is just adequate um, access to health care and um, proper health care. And then, you know, just establishing the trust with when it comes to health care and making sure that, you know, the individuals want to go see, get treated, um, get the help that they need to improve their outcomes versus, um, you know, that the stigmatism that something's going to happen to them while they are seeking out those health care um, advice. It sounds like several different factors converging. Yeah. So the, a question for Rebecca, um, and this is in quantifying broadband access. Does your broadband availability data allow you to differentiate between one one time accessors versus sustainable long term unlimited access? Uh, one time accessors. Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the one time accessor, but um, so availability data, which is um, reported by internet service providers, meaning um, they say that this level of service of internet service broadband um, speed is available to this area at this time. Um, so between one time and long term, I guess um, the the more sort of long term makes me think about what I was talking about with the UCLA and M Lab, where um, maybe you're trying to ask about uh, this the durability or or uh, reliability of internet over time. So the NTIA data does include measures um, for both of those things. Um, I'm almost tempted to say like the one time access makes me think of um, of a different form of telehealth where people who don't have access at home can still go to like a critical care access hospital and access broadband. Um, it, but, you know, that would be covered under like broadband is available in that area that they're going to. I think we would miss that they would access it at the hospital because we would be saying that they don't have it at their home location. May I, may I pop in with a question? How is like the Starlink captured in the FDA broadband map? Oh, uh, I don't think that it, that's, you know, one of my mentors actually asked me that question and I haven't, um, I haven't been <laughs> to the full answer yet, but I don't think that the, the Starlink or the um, satellite sort of stuff is included yet. And I haven't really seen much talk about um, where to include that in any of these data sets. Thanks. Uh, I think it's probably a good time to, to wrap up here. We're at the top of the hour. Thank you again, Dr. Johnson, for your excellent moderation. Thank you, Dr. Davis and Ms. Smith for your great talks. And uh, we look forward to our next Cancer Moonshot Seminar Series, which will be on March 23rd. The Precancer Atlas is of Cutaneous and Hemologic Origin by Dr. Santgata. So thanks, everyone. That was great.